So Alex, I'm going to let you uh, introduce yourself, but uh, Alex has been very much sort of a mentor of ALD Connect and helped us uh, really form a few years ago. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, actually, I think Florin covered everything, so there's no need for my talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, so anyway, so let's change probably uh, uh, our conversation to a little bit different ways. So, so uh, um, we're going to uh, divide my uh, uh, talk into two parts. I will be talking about more general things like big data. And then Justin here will be talking about patients' perspective on the big data and how we can increase this. And we'll try to do it a little bit shorter, but then we can probably have like 10, 15 minutes of discussion not questions, but rather comments from the audience, because you are much more experienced, at least summary-wise, than we are here standing here. So uh, with this, and Dean, please make sure that the time starts now, not at 9 a.m. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so let's talk about big data. So probably all of you heard the term big data. What is it? Why do we need big data? And how big is big? especially in things like rare diseases. Uh, so uh, what's important is if we want, uh, we were discussing this yesterday, and actually a lot of people don't really understand that there are very many rare diseases out there. Uh, actually, uh, by the latest NIH count, about 7,200 rare diseases. And only less than 500 of them have any kind of a cure or medication that may be administered. So what to do for the rest of this? So these diseases compete. Allow me to, to say it again. So these diseases compete for the attention of the industry. Because what the industry needs is several things. One is that they have to look at the disease that has validated biomarkers and outcome measures so they, they can prove to the FDA that their drug works. Temperature goes down, tumor volume goes down, uh, and so on and so forth. So for this, you need a huge amount of data, and we can talk about this. Another thing what they need is clinicians who know how to administer those outcome measures. And then they have to have an, or, an organization or organized and willing patients to participate in clinical research. So only these three things will give us, kind of will allow a disease say, hey industry, we're ready for you. So we are right now in this process where from coming from almost nowhere, our as you saw three years or four years later, not necessarily because of this organization, but because of the awareness of uh, rare diseases community and the awareness of the patient's community, we're much better now. And as Florian was showing us, industry advisory council people. So there are 10, 13, 14, 15 companies coming to our advisory council, advising us what would they need from us, us as a community, for them to move forward and invest into this particular disease. Okay, so with this, we need big data. Two things, A, we need to know who have this disease. Basically, how do we identify patients? We're discussing this for many years and the number is probably 5,000 in the United States or that's the common denominator. So when I asked yesterday several people, they say, oh, no, 15,000, 14,000, 10,000. I am aware probably of less than 1,000 patients in the United States that coming to our community. Where are the rest? So hopefully with this newborn screening effort and so on, we can identify these people. The next thing is knowing who these patients are, how can we extract extract data from them, information from them, that we can merge this information together, understand the disease, understand the uh, subpopulations of this disease, understand the needs, 
and then say, again, industry, we're ready for you. Answer, either cure the disease or address the symptoms. And these are the bothering symptoms, and that's what Justin will be talking about. So basically, one of the major things to do is how to turn patients into willing research participants. There are a bunch of information. Uh, I don't know, where do I point? So, so basically, all these things that are, you can see on the screen could serve as information sources and work for us if we can figure out how to get extract data from these sources. Clinical trials, so hopefully we will be there where we have a bunch of companies working on clinical trials. And then, and this is culture change, sharing data back, adding data back to this pool of data or bucket of data, if you wish, so we can analyze and understand the disease. So. In, uh, I will be referencing ALS a lot because ALS is a much more advanced disease in this cultural change. So now it's a norm for ALS or for companies that do research in ALS to bring the data back to the pool of the identified data of ALS tr clinical trials data sets. To analyze the disease, to find the disease subpopulations, to find new outcome measures, biomarkers, and so on. So health records, another beautiful thing, right? So unfortunately, not many he uh, uh, health record vendors allow us to enter structured disease information into health records because they're meant for different things, liabilities, billing, and so on. So it's a challenge, but still we can get a lot of information from health records. The challenge is how to get this information out, not just technology-wise, but also regulatory-wise, because it contains patient health information. So do we, how do we get not only permission from the patient, because you, patients can say, sure, take my data. Our IRBs may not allow us to take this data. So that's another cultural change in the regulatory side, on the regulatory side of the process. Natural histories, and that's what we do here, we'll be t talking about this. Connecting clinical phenotypical data to biobanks, to images, to patient reported outcomes, and that's huge, as you know now, right? So uh, a lot of diseases now tracking everything. In Parkinson's, they have applications that can uh, track your speech, they can track how you walk the gate, the speed accelerometer is involved, so how you turn around and so on. So everything may make sense. So uh, genetics, whole genome sequences, uh, uh, proteomics, uh, metabolomics, uh, microbiomics now is important, as they're saying, cell lines and mobile apps and so on. So what do we do with all these things? So there are a number of tools. I will not be talking about these tools now, but there are probably several tools that are relevant to our conversation. Did, where should I point? Because um, is there a specific... Yeah, so uh, basically there are a number of tools that we developed over these years that allow us to aggregate this data and then uh, share this data with others. So again, it's not just technology. Technology can do anything. So, but people have to agree to collaborate because it's quite a competitive uh, environment out there, not only between the companies, but also between academic institutions, between individual scientists, clinicians, and so on. So uh, we need to create this environment where it's beneficial to everyone to collaborate rather than to work alone. Uh, probably the next, yes. So uh, we'll be concentrating on these two tools. And the idea is, how do we get this information? Are you sure? No, it's a good thing, but very beautiful one. Thank you. <laughs> Just looking for a pointer. No, no, you point the point I want to to move forward. Oh, okay. Uh, I didn't mean to do that, but someone did. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, so, so in order for us to organize all these things together, we need to identify patients. How do I securely identify patients without 
identifying their or bringing their identity to the surface, right? So it's quite a challenge. So uh, we cannot use medical records because they're patient health information, PHI, and we're not allowed to share this information. We cannot use patient names, social security numbers, security numbers, even if we patients have social security numbers, in Europe they don't. So what do we do with this? So NIH several years ago created a technology that is known as GUID or GUID, Global Unique Identifiers. They're global, but within a given disease. So otherwise it would be global medical record number. So uh, we use this technology, NIH gave us the rights to this technology, and we created neurological global unique identifier or neurogood. The way this works, uh, and another one. So it, it's kind of very simple. So you enter information, patient information, or patient centers information. So some of you who went to our patient portal know how to do this. So you enter this information. Information is being checked, so it's double data entry. Then we merge this information together, create three strings out of this information, encrypt those strings, and then send it to the server, and server returns back uh, a, so you say generate GUID, and what comes back is an 11 character random string. So basically, this string is a random string. That means that you cannot reverse engineer it back to the patient because there is nothing here that contains patient information. That's very important because people are asking me all uh, again and again how secure it is. The danger only is that if you participate in several studies, someone will know when we're merging this study's information together that a person participated here and there without knowing who this person is. So in order for us to collaborate, we also have this uh, regulatory document. So probably some of you participate in our uh, natural history study, and we're asking you to sign so-called informed consent form. And in the informed consent form, we're asking you or telling you, besides other things, two things. A, this neuro good will be used. Again, the danger is not to reverse engineer information back to you, but rather to identify that person to participate in multiple studies to connect the information. But another very important thing is that if some of you participated in other studies, you probably uh, saw that they're saying, oh, I will be, and my information, my data may be used for ALD research at Mass General, or for local dystrophy research at Stanford. That means that Florian and Keith will not be able to share information between themselves. That's very important. So what we're putting now there is one single paragraph that says, my information will be used, not may be used, but will be used for any medical research purpose. So back here, so uh, we created, besides GUID, we created this tool that is known as NeuroBank. And the idea behind NeuroBank is very simple. When patient comes to multiple studies, a subject ID is being assigned to this patient, to this person, in multiple studies, and every time every study assigns a, a different subject ID, there is no way to connect information between. So here what we're saying is this. Create a patient in this platform called NeuroBank with this global unique identifier, and then say, hey, this patient agreed, consented, and participated in this particular study, natural history and ALG study. What happens is view, uh, visits and forms for this patient, for this study, for the team that conducts this study, become visible in this platform. When the same person consents to a different study, only that second study's team is allowed to see forms and visits for that patient in their study. And they may not even suspect that the same person participates in two, three, five studies. But if those two investigators know about each other and 
they may pre-agree that if such thing happens and the person, the patient, participates in their studies, both studies, they may share some information like demographics, family history, disease history, I don't know, medications. It makes no sense to ask date of birth again and again because it's already in the study. So if they do agree, and if this patient consents to the second study, this second study team is quite surprised, or pleasantly surprised, to discover that certain information is already entered for them by the first study team. So that's the idea behind it. So what we have here, okay, so, so basically these are some of the forms and the, the application, I don't know what should I do to change. Okay, so the, the idea behind it is that the application is quite uh, flexible. So this is the study. Thank you, Tim. Beautiful. So uh, this is the natural history study, and five of our institutions, as Florian was saying, uh, participate in this study, and we have uh, many patients in there. And the idea behind is that you create a base one-line workflow. You say what is available for this study information-wise uh, for this particular patient, and then you say, okay, so this is what we're planning to collect. And if you check these things and click Save, so these new forms become available to you. So they will not be available to the investigator from the very beginning because we don't know. We don't want to clutter the space. But it's flexible and show, aha, so if you're planning to do hormonal testing, sure, here's the form for you to report on the results. So, and the idea, uh, as I said, are, uh, this is our future. This is the slide from ALS, and we were discussing uh, this morning at the table. So how is ALS ahead of us and not here? So I have, in ALS, we have 17 studies that use NeuroBank. All studies have phenotypical clinical information. Some of them collect biofluids. Some of them collect images. Some of them collect DNAs, and we have 4,700 whole genome sequences for these participants. Some of them collect uh, cell lines and patient reported outcomes and so on. But the idea behind that, we have the enrollment goal of 6,000 subjects or patients out of the 17 studies alone. And the goal actually in three years to have 36 studies in this neurobank for ALS alone. And some of these patients may participate in multiple studies. So in one study, they may collect image on them. They may collect biofluids in, the bio in a different study. And in the third study, they may have patient-reported outcomes and report through patient portal. But the idea is that from clinical perspective or from the researcher's perspective, it's a commitment on their part as well. And the comment commitment is as follows. We provide this platform to them with one condition that after they enjoy using this platform and enter data for their patients and close their study and analyze and publish, the data will be swept automatically and added to this bucket of de-identified data from multiple studies. And anyone in the world who wants to dig into this data, who cares about this disease, will be able to reach this data and analyze, download and analyze. And it's a constant process, so the new study ends, the data is added again and again and again. This is what we mean. Again, there are multiple interpretations of what big data is or are. This is our meaning of big data. So bringing the community together, bringing all kinds of affinity groups together. So uh, you saw this, and you will be hearing from Justin in a second about this, but that's important. So we need to know what's important to the patients because clinicians may have their own perceptions of what's important. So we're asking to join, but another important thing is that to ask what bothers you guys, right? And we know that different things, and Justin has these numbers, I don't want to emphasize it in my talk, but we also came up with this neuro tracker. And one of the things we're asking and will be asking is how to fine tune this tool. This is a tool, but we don't know how 
granular these answers are or how meaningful they are because these tools were I mean developed in the lab if you wish but not in the uh, as a dialogue so we need a dialogue on this so the application actually now allows you to do uh, anyone participates in patients like me by any chance so basically what you can do now is not only to track your performance over or your answers over longitudinally over the years or months but also you can compare your answers to the crowd to people who participate in this so it's I don't know whether how important it is because it's you know population is quite heterogeneous but at least we're trying to figure out how useful this information is. We do know it's useful for us on the back end, on the big data side, but we need input from the patients to understand how useful it is to the patients, right? So, and meaningful to the patients because otherwise, you know, it's our perception what's in there. Again, the idea is this, how do we, how do we put patients in the center and try to get out information to move the disease forward and to bring industry in. And it's quite impressive that we have so many industry representatives here today. Just. Thank you, Alex. Does this thing work? Do we know? Which way do I? Okay, so I, I've been asked to just kind of uh, give what we're calling the patient perspective on uh, the neuro tracker. And so a little bit about me as a patient. Uh, my first off, my name is Justin Diagostino. I'm a 32 year old man. I have AMN uh, and ALD. It's all one thing. Uh, I like to just say I'm an ALD man. Um, I was diagnosed with AMN when I was 23 years old, so about a decade ago, and it was a year after my brother was diagnosed. Um, and my brother had sort of rapid onset of cerebral ALD in his late teens, and he passed away in 2010. And uh, I, for a number of years through my 20s, kind of lived in denial and said, you know, I don't have it, it's never gonna happen to me. And then, of course, you know, it began to happen. And so in the last several years, I have um, just dedicated myself to the ALD community. Um, I'm now a board member and patient liaison with the Myelin Project, and I love interacting and interfacing with patients, men and women, talking about their experiences. So the NeuroTracker is kind of an extra layer, it's an extra dimension to understanding the experiences of people dealing with this disease. And uh, there's a cool function that's been recently added where you can kind of compare yourself to the crowd. Some people might like that, some people might not. I think it's kind of cool. Um, a quick, you know, uh, things about me with regards to the neuro tracker and, you know, who I am. I'm definitely kind of a data nerd. I love understanding information. I wish I would have implemented something like this in my life years ago five, six years ago where I was tracking myself, tracking my abilities. I recently started uh, a run test uh, and I'm not a very good, I can't really run that well anymore, but I can kind of trot along. It's, and and uh, my girlfriend times me in a 50 yard dash and I've been doing it for the last three months and my times have been stable, <laughs> um, but they're not very good times. Um, and, and I also do things like I have this, um, uh, it's uh, a just kind of a workout. Um, it's called a, um, I'm totally spacing on the name, but it's, it's, uh, it's a little workout machine. I do these squats and I, I, you know, I kind of track myself and my ability to do, you know, how many squats can I do? And when I get up to like 30, can I do 30 really well? Or does 30, you know, take like extra effort at the end? So I, I track myself. So the neuro tracker is kind of an extension of this. So let me just kind of talk through um, so we're up to the NeuroBank side is 155 patients, but on the patient portal NeuroTracker side, we have 370. Actually, it's, I think it's up to 376 now. Yeah, um, I, it was the old one. I didn't really update, but we're, I think we're up to 376. Uh, 226 or a little bit more are self-reporting than the rest are from caregivers and children. And so that's a good number, but we want to increase that number. There's, there's quite a few more out there. So we want to recruit, we want to promote this, we want to get as many people as possible um, a part of this. 
And then we have this kind of what matters to me that uh, Alex briefly showed you guys of, you know, um, wh what does the community care about? And uh, yes. Sorry, just on this slide before. Yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, Go ahead. Yes. So just on the slide, this slide right here. So, uh, so in Neurobank, uh, we have 155 patients. In each portal, we have 370. Uh, and so if you subtract out the caregivers, it There's more patients in uh, patient portal than we're getting capturing in Neurobank. Is that? Uh, I would, that's correct, yeah. We have more people sort of self-reporting that have signed up versus, you know, doctors and clinicians reporting on. And do we have any idea why that is? Are they patients who are at places where we, uh, they're not at one of the centers or why are we missing, you know, more than half the patients? So we have 19 patients. Sorry, Jen. We have 19 patients that participate in both Neurobank clinical study, natural history study, and in patient portal. So what's important is to have them all in both places, right? So we can compare. One of the things to compare is, is there a difference in physician applied outcome measures or patient self-reported outcome measures, for example, right, to, to understand the difference. So ideally, we need them both. And what Justin will be talking about, actually, is how can we increase the numbers in both. And uh, it's, it's extremely important. And we're definitely, as you know, Josh, we're behind on the left side of this. Uh, and Justin, on the patient portal, do we have a, does it, do we know where patients are, like in the country? Are they kind of, can you create a de-identified zone, like a 100-mile zone or something in patient portal? Um, if, if uh, Alex would know. I don't think we have any kind of demographic data on. Demographic data, but not the geographical. Because that might be a nice feature. I don't know how hard yeah. that would be to add a geographical privacy zone, you know, some of the way that some of the fitness yeah. trackers do, but people could just. I, yeah. I mean, I'm one of the 370. I don't know, you know, how these people stumble across it. I know that, um, you know, we're just wanting to get more, and there's more out there, and we're wanting to increase these numbers. Um, so, but th those are good numbers. Those are positive numbers for, you know, this hasn't been around for very long. So these are actually very positive numbers in, in my mind for, you know, um, I was first turned on to the NeuroTracker back in February in Austin, Texas at the Patient Learning Academy with Brian Chandler. So, um, you know, this is all pretty recent. So let me go back to the what matters to me. This is kind of interesting. This is just sort of an overview of the current data set. And, um, you know, this requires some interpretation here. Um, for instance, the adrenal dysfunction is sort of the most important category. And I think that that's interesting because we need to ask the question, well, what does that mean? What, what, is, what are people meaning when they say that adrenal dysfunction is the thing that matters to them the most? And it could be related to something like fatigue or it could be some other issues. So, you know, we need to work on improving the data to really understand what that means. And for instance, you know, walking speed seems to be fairly unimportant, which I think is kind of interesting, you know, given that walking is kind of like one of the main issues in AMN, and it's certainly a high issue for me. Could it be the fact that, you know, it's saying my walking speed, maybe we should change that to mobility? Because maybe some people are like, well, my, I don't really care about my speed anymore, but I do care about my mobility, and those are different things. So we need just to ask questions and kind of go through this. And um, you know, I just want to say, you know, I'm I'm so grateful that Dr. Eichler and the ALD Connect team has sort of invited me to kind of start thinking through this. And I've kind of assembled a little bit of a work group or task force to begin, you know, patients specifically kind of analyzing each question, trying to figure out what's the best way to capture the data. So here you can, I don't know if you guys can read that very well, but um, these are just kind of some of the um, questions for the children, uh, things like bowel and bladder, seizures, language, digestion, movements, vision, sleep, spasms, hearing, and we have, you, that you can select sort of different, what we're calling increments, symptomental, symptom, symptoms and the increments of those symptoms. And then it's kind of the same for here's adults, sleep, independence, um, and so, you know, kind of moving through each question, trying to figure out, well, what's the best way 
to determine or figure out what a person's experience in this specific category. And um, so I'm gonna talk about just real quick and I'll just, this will be my, my talk for today, but just what I'm calling the challenges um, to the neuro tracker. And I just wanna first say, you know, I've, I've put a team together of patients, um, female Jana is back there. She's, I, she's come on board and, and, you know, so we have some patients involved, but you know, it'd also be good to have doctors, their insight and that sort of thing. And uh, just to kind of keep chipping away and contributing um, to this. Um, okay, so, you know, the question of what are the increments of symptoms? So when I think about my life and I think about something like walking, you know, what have, what are the increments? What are the, what are the distinct increments? Because I can say, you know, it's declined over the years. It's gotten worse. Where was I at three years ago versus where I am now? And, you know, one of the problems is the way that the, the question of the neuro tracker currently is, is there's a category that says, I generally walk well. Well, I would say that was true three years ago, and I would still say that's true of me today. I can kind of walk pretty good and fine, but I would say in the last three years, my walking ability has significantly declined, but I would answer that question the same exact way. So the neuro tracker, I think, needs, like we say, granularity or nuance. So something like this, you know, some symptoms might have four, five, or six distinct increments, whereas another symptom might only have three or four. So we need to kind of look at that and kind of determine from a clinical perspective, from a patient perspective, what, how does this symptom move along, right? And then the next category, uh, and so for instance, like under the mood category, right now, the first, first option is I'm a happy person, okay? You know, that can be interpreted in a variety of ways. And then it moves from I am a happy person to I have extreme mood swings. It's a big gap, right? <laughs> I'm a happy person to I have extreme mood swings, you know? And I would say maybe both of those things describe, describe me from time to time, you know? So trying to work on mood, you know, mood is certainly something that's an element of the AMN experience and trying to determine, you know, what's the best way to go about describing that. And then, um, you know, we want to have non-overlapping answers, which means we don't, you never want to look at something and say, well, I could answer two of those, or I could answer three of those, or all of those fit for me, or something like that. You, we want to have it to where, you know, each answer is unique. And I, at the end, I'm going to kind of propose sort of my idea of what to do in the future with NeuroTracker. Um, and then clarity of voice, we want to make sure that a wide spectrum of patients from all different cultural backgrounds and educational levels and, you know, all over the place that they can understand this and that they can submit their data and that it will be effective. Uh, that's really important. And then um, this is kind of a big thing for me, and I don't know how big of a deal this is, theoretically speaking, for the neuro tracker, but really trying to close the gap between what we call objective and anecdotal data. So there's a difference between saying, I generally walk well versus I can walk X number of yards in you know, X number of seconds or X number of wh whatever the time is, right? So those are two different things. And like, well, there's a category on there with balance. And the balance category already kind of has some objective language where it's asking you, you know, I can stand with my feet together and my eyes closed, or, and you know, if you can't do it, and I can kind of do that, I start to kind of sway a little bit. And then, you know, I stand with my eyes closed and feet apart, that's fine, or I have to have my eyes. So those are, that's like an actual test, balance test. So I think that's great. That's kind of what we can call objective uh, data. And then this is my suggestion. This is my, my big genius idea for the neuro tracker is I think we, it, it makes sense to transition out of the sort of selecting sentences for answers, something like I generally walk well, or you know, you know, four or five categories into what I'm just calling like a 10 point sliding scale. And the scale will still have descriptors, like we'll have a pre-symptomatic category, and then at, well, at the midpoint, the five, we'll have kind of the, like what we consider to be the middle ground for that symptom, and then the zero would be like the worst. So in the walking category, it would go from I generally walk well to I am wheelchair bound. 
that's kind of like the full spectrum of the walking experience, right? And then we try and find something in the middle that might be something like I ha require the use of a cane or I require the use of some kind of walking instrument, you know, but I'm st I can still get up and, and move around. So I think that that'll give, that'll add data to have sort of, you know, for people to be like, eh, you know, think about, you know, I'm a six or nah, I'm a four or I'm a five, you know, kind of to play around with that. So every question could be put on this 10 point sliding scale and kind of standardize it. And I think what that'll do is that'll remove vagueness from language and the potential for people to misinterpret, uh, you know, and select the wrong answer. And I want to end with this, which is the bladder. This is the way the bladder is currently structured. And bladder for me has been like one of the number one concerns. I would say the bladder was sort of the first symptom I began that began appearing in my life around the ages of probably 25, 26. I just started noticing urgency and hesitancy. I was like, this is what the heck's going on with me, you know? And um, so when I look at this currently, I would say that I fit currently into all three of categories, I have urgency and hesitancy, I occasionally have accidents, and I have no control of my bladder. I would say that all three of those kind of apply to me in different ways. So I don't know really which one to select in this, you know, the way that it's currently structured. Um, so it's important, you know, something like this is, you know, bladder is certainly a key symptom within the AMN experience is, you know, if we move to a, you know, a 10 point sliding scale, you know, it'd be my bladder works well. And then the, you know, the very end would be, I have no control over my bladder, but even that, you know, might need some clarification and then somewhere in the middle, um, you know, I, I, I don't know what it would be yet, but so that's the basic idea with the neuro tracker. And I, I would just like to say as a patient from my own perspective, you know, I, I just, what I love about the neuro tracker is the opportunity to be part of what I would call like a data family. And my experiences, my symptoms, being a part of something larger, and I, to know that I'm not just this isolated person, that you know, like what I'm experiencing is completely alone, and I'm all alone. On the